Mobile hunters, if you're interested in upping your mobile game, then head to tetherednation.com and check out their saddle gear. There are a few things that you can buy that will actually help you become a better deer hunter or give you the freedom to hunt any tree or any situation. This reason is why I started saddle hunting in the first place and why I use Tethered's gear. I can honestly say that Tethered's saddle gear has changed how I hunt for the better. Big tree, little tree, from the ground, it doesn't matter. I'm untethered by my gear to hunt the best setup for the situation instead of hunting for a tree that my gear can use. My current course setup consists of the Phantom Saddle, Tethered One Sticks, and the Predator Platform, and along with an assortment of their accessories. So if you want to up your mobile game, head over to tetherednation.com. If you're like me, you spend a lot of time pouring over maps, looking at weather data, all in an effort to help predict when and where my best times are to hunt. It'd be nice if there was a reliable source with all this information in one place. Enter the Spartan Forge app. Unlike some other predictive apps on the market, Spartan Forge was created from military combat intelligence experience tailored for hunters and stands at the nexus of machine learning and whitetail deer hunting. No more man-made algorithms. This is a predictive model based on real GPS collared deer data, historical and predictive weather, and the next level of mapping imagery. All at my fingertips. I've had an opportunity to use the desktop version last year and have been using the iOS app this season, and it has replaced all my other mapping tools. Visit SpartanForge.ai and sign up today, or head to your iOS or Android app store and download it today. Welcome to the Truth From A Stand Deer Hunting Podcast brought to you by Skull Brew Coffee Company. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you're listening to episode number 270. Today, I'm joined by my buddy, Troy Pottinger, to discuss killing next year's deer with this winter's sheds. So stay tuned. All right, all right, all right. What is up, everyone? Happy Wednesday to you. Hope you're doing well. Hope you are feeling fine and hope that... Those of you out there that are able to get out are getting out into the timber and getting a, a jump start on your uh, postseason scouting, making plans for, for next year. Uh, past weekend, I actually had a pretty decent session. The weekend prior was kind of a, didn't produce a, didn't produce a whole lot. Um, weather was a little bit better. So uh, some of the areas that say colder, so less people were out. So it was navigating less people, which was good. Um, this one particular area I was kind of staying out of because I had some bucks that were still holding that I had on camera. And so I was just trying to wait till uh, they started hitting this particular camera and noticing that they had dropped. And it seemed like most of them had dropped. I had an idea where they might be betting. And be honest with you, I'm I'm not the world's best shed hunter. Um, I, I usually get distracted. I'm not one of these guys that can shed hunt and scout. I have to kind of do one or the other. I'll start off with the intention of shed hunting. And then it quickly moves in just to a full out scout. And that's kind of where my mind goes. And that's basically what happened this past weekend. Uh, jumped into this particular piece, um, had a really good deer on it uh, this past year um, that I, I've told the story a couple of times. I didn't give any particulars about him, but I, I missed him by a day or a few hours, a couple of different times where I was in a spot trying to kill him. He showed up, you know, the, the very next morning and then, you know, missed him by a day, another in another area. Um, some primary scrapes that I had been kind of monitoring him on. I probably screwed the pooch and should have killed him or tried to kill him earlier in the season. He was way more daylight active at the very, very beginning of the season. And I had him kind of pegged and I just, I was probably too patient on that particular deer. So anyway, um, I haven't seen him in a while, which isn't, uh, isn't crazy because he wasn't a buck that was um, really consistent in this particular area until like mid September into the, like the very beginning of October is whenever he really showed up. I think I got two trail camera pictures of him once in like June and once in, I want to say maybe uh, July. Other than that, he was pretty much a phantom, you know, I never really saw him otherwise. So, you know, he could have very well at the end of the fall kind of split and, you know, went back to wherever his, uh, you know, primary winter, summer, you know, uh, home range would be. Um, however, I was hoping to at least get like a picture of him to know that he was still, uh, still alive. But with that said, <clears throat> I went into this piece kind of scouting specifically for him, hoping that he's, you know, made it through, um, gun season and, uh, really didn't where I thought I would find, uh, his, his sign. Um, it was, it was pretty much a swing and a miss. Um, he has some really, uh, unique antler characteristics, uh, that would make it easy to see 
uh, if he's laying down rubs in a, in a particular uh, place. Um, and he was also, you know, by, you know, by and large, far and away, the largest deer that was in this general area. So, you know, if there was some big sign that was laid down somewhere, it was likely going to be his, especially if it was, you know, uh, big rubs. Um, it was going to be really easy to tell if it was him or not just based on his, you know, like I said, like his, his antler characteristics. And so I did find a, um, signpost rub in this particular spot that I had overlooked a couple different times. Like I was basically started out the scout or the session shed hunting. Cause I thought I had an idea where he was spending time. And so I kind of grid searched this one whole area and didn't come up with anything, but I ended up running across a big, uh, signpost rub that I had not seen in the past year and a half, two years that I had been on this, uh, on this piece. So that was a nice little piece of Intel to find, find, I found a couple other scrapes that weren't necessarily community scrapes, but just kind of good to know. Cause it kind of helped make more sense of why I was seeing him on certain cameras at certain times and stuff like that. So there seems to be, you know, a general kind of loop or an area, you know, different areas that he's going to check and things like that. I need to go back and look at the trail camera data and see if I can get a sense of, of, of potential kind of wind direction when he might be making those specific loops and stuff like that and see if there's more of a rhyme to a reason, uh, to why I was picking him up. And then I kind of went into this area where I had these deer on camera where I thought I might be able to find some sheds. Um, didn't find any, but ended up jumping into this kind of section that I hadn't spent a whole lot of time on, to be quite honest with you. Like I've, I've spent some time on the fringe of this one kind of area. That's really kind of thick and gnarly. Um, and, uh, I was actually getting ready to leave cause I had some, uh, had a, had a date night with the, with my wife last night. So I was, you know, kind of heading out of the woods a little bit earlier and I only got really probably like five hours, uh, worth of scouting in. Um, and just something caught my eye as I was getting ready to leave and I was kind of getting ready to walk up, you know, toward, you know, out toward where I had parked. And, um, and I just kind of out of the corner of my eye, thought I saw a rub and I kind of looked a little closer and I was like, oh man, that looks like a decent rub. And so I walked back into this kind of like thick, nasty cover. And sure enough, there was a really good sized rub that was there that had some characteristics that made me think it was probably the hidey hole of the deer that I was uh, chasing this past year. And then as I started looking around, it was like in this little 10 yard area, it was like, man, there's a rub, there's a rub, there's a rub, there's a rub. And, and there were a few specific ones just based on tine height, like tick marks of the tines. Um, and the amount of shred <clears throat> that, uh, was put on this tree, um, and based, like I said, on some antler characteristics and stuff like that, it made me feel um, probably like 85% certain that it was probably that deer laying down that sign. And that's where he's wanting to spend some time, uh, in the fall is a little hidey hole. It's probably one of the hardest spots to get to in this particular piece. Uh, and he can probably be unbothered there. And basically where I'm picking him up on different trail cameras, which aren't too far from this spot, the timestamps would kind of, would kind of make sense. And also just his general kind of travel route. Um, the funny story is, is I actually hunted probably, I don't know, 50 yards outside of this particular spot one time in late October in a monsoon. Um, you know, whether he was there or not, I, I have no clue. I would guess, I would guess probably not. Um, cause I didn't pick him up on that trail camera uh, that was in that drone area until a little bit later. Um, but it seems like that is a hang of his. And so the goal now is to go back in the next session and kind of finish scouting that particular piece out because I feel like I have some decent Intel. Um, also feel like, you know, well, at least when I was looking around, there's good historical sign in there too. So just in general, it seems like bucks want to spend some time there. It's kind of secluded out of the way and, uh, extremely hard to get to, uh, access to that spot to be quiet and things like that. Or it, it, it's a pain in the ass. Like it, I hunted that spot specifically whenever it was wet this past year, because of that, uh, at least I could be a little bit more quiet getting in. Um, so it's a pretty bulletproof setup. So with that, we'll go ahead and get ready to jump into today's podcast. Uh, if you haven't yet head over to skullbrewcoffee.com, pick yourself up some kick-ass coffee. You can use the promo code TFTS, uh, 21 and get a discount on that. And then you can also head to truth from merch tab and pick yourself up some merch swag, uh, TFTS 21 there as well, uh, to get some savings on some merch. So today I have my good buddy, Troy Pottinger on. If you guys haven't listened before, we did a podcast back in probably, I want to say August or September talking about scrapes. He has a really unique way where he, how he sets up mock scrapes and how he uses and hunts scrapes. Um, specifically because he hunts in the big woods of Idaho where he's battling predators and things like that. So if you want to hear about Troy's kind of method for scrapes, go back and listen to that podcast. I've kind of adopted his approach in um, getting great results just this, just this past year. What we're talking about today is uh, really 
Troy's uh, approach to shed hunting and what it really means for him during the course of a season. You know, um, there's different kind of schools of thought as to whether or not, you know, you kill bucks where you might find sheds. Plenty of people do. Some people don't believe it, but the way Troy kind of hunts uh, and his approach to the mountains and the big woods and based on different factors around, you know, weather and snowfall and stuff like that kind of help him date when these bucks may or may not be in those particular areas and know whether or not those deer might be killable in those areas. And so what we're really talking about today is how to use shed hunting and finding sheds to kill next year's buck. So with that, we'll go ahead and jump into today's show. And as always, I want to thank you all for listening. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Truth from the Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. And today I've got a two-time offender on, my my buddy, Mr. Troy Pottinger, coming from the potato state of Idaho. How's it going, man? Good. Good to hear from you, Clint. You too, man. I know we've been kind of staying up to date or catching up every so often via text message, uh, message and stuff like that. But uh, how's the uh, how's the snow looking out in your area? I uh, was just literally up on the mountains behind my place 20 minutes ago helping a guy. And uh, yeah, it looks, you know, I obviously when I was up there, I was scanning everything. And right. even some of my norths are starting to melt now. So it's starting to look good. Oh, are they? Okay. Is this, is this normal or early or what? Um, it's early. It's, it's, I'm excited because it gives me, it gives me more time to get out and hike a ton and shed hunt and do a bunch of pretty applicable postseason scouting. The sign will still show up pretty good after that snow melts off of it. Nice. Yeah. We had, we've had a little bit of snow here as well. Not nearly as bad as we had last year. So I'm hoping that it kind of stays that way and I can get, I got one day out so far. Um, I ended up catching the stinking uh, COVID there a couple weeks ago. So it kind of knocked me in the dirt for a little bit and I wasn't really able to get out, but I'm finally getting my legs and my wind back. So over the next couple of weeks, it'll be kind of a full, uh, full court press, but in that same kind of, vein of trying to get my body back together, man. I just spent an hour in a sauna in, in a uh, sensory deprivation float. Have you ever done that before? No, I'm not that high tech. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Now, now my son that's over playing college football, he gets all those fancy amenities to take care of his body with. I was going to say, maybe, maybe he can hook the old man up, you know, after a hard hunting season, maybe get you in the, uh, in the football a trainer room get you in the ice yeah. tub little float tank little sauna yeah he's got like a 30 million dollar facility that he has at his back and call <laughs> <laughs> nice yeah that, that doesn't seem he had a good season this year too right man i was following along with you he, he did really good uh you know he's a diehard whitetail guy that grew up under my wing and he misses he misses it terribly but he knows that football is is his love and passion and priority for the next five years, counting this red shirt. But no, he did really good. He got on the field. He, as a red shirt, you can play in four games. Yeah, yeah. And Ty, Ty plays for Montana State, which is an FCS school. Mm-hmm. Um, they had an unbelievable season. They made it to the national championship. They they did get beat by the Big King, North Dakota State, but they're on a they're really on a mission to to be the team that can contend year in and year out. And Ty got to play in a couple games and actually moved up to number two on the depth chart for about eight games of the season. Nice. Yeah. I was following along on your Instagram posts and stuff like that. And I saw it, they were playing North Dakota state. You know, I I saw that they made it to the, to the championship and I was stoked for you Uh, and him, him, of course, but um, they, that North Dakota state, man, they're putting out pretty regularly now putting out NFL, NFL prospects. So that's absolutely. Yep. And Tyson's team too. uh, That, the the Bobcats put out well Troy Anderson's in the combine. He's probably one of the best linebackers in the country. He he played in the senior bowl and started and called the defense in the senior bowl. Oh wow. Yeah, that's awesome. Which you don't see an FCS guy do that hardly ever. Right. Yeah. Uh middle linebacker, outside linebacker, what uh that guy? Uh, he played middle for us, but he'll be an outside. He's about he's about six three, six four, two forty and runs a legitimate four four, high four four forty. Wow. Yeah. He's moving. But he'll be an outside in the NFL. Yeah. Outside right. linebacker in the NFL. Yep. Yeah. Cause my Steelers are looking for probably a middle linebacker. And so I was paying attention a little bit to the, to the senior bowl, just to see, you know, who those, yep. who those guys were that were at the senior bowl, you know, outside of Dean from, from Georgia, who's just a beast. Who's probably not going to be there when we pick, but I was just, you know, curious what position right. he was playing. Right. And they're kind of talking, you know, those, there was, a, there was a couple guys from North Dakota state there too. And, the, and then, you know, we, 
talking about that whole level, that FCS level at the top end really puts out some good football players. Yeah, for sure. I mean, just in the past couple of years, I mean, just, you know, names that ring a bell for me that came from there, if I'm not mistaken, Josh Allen, right? He came from North Coast State, right? No, he came from Wyoming. Oh, Wyoming. Okay. Who, who, well, who's the quarterback? Was it Carson Wentz? Yeah, Wentz. Yeah, okay. And and the kid that's at San Francisco, uh, uh, Trey uh, Lance. Trey Lance, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they and Stat, uh, Easton Stitt, mm -hmm. or Stick, he is in the NFL as a backup for somebody too, and he's really good out of North Dakota State. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so they got you guys in that in that area up there. You guys seem to have a little pipeline of some uh, of some quarterback play that's uh, making some waves in the NFL. So that's awesome, man. I'm happy for happy for you. Happy for him. Glad he got on the field, and uh, I look forward to uh, following along a little bit more closely now that he won't be uh, won't be redshirted next year. I might have to become a uh, a pseudo Bobcats fan. I always like to follow mm -hmm. follow folks who I know whenever they have kids that are out doing doing cool stuff. I like to follow along. Well, I think you think you'll enjoy it. I hope you do because I think my son's got a real good future ahead of him, and he's nice. a he is a dedicated and he's a smart kid, and he is a he's a tough, hard worker. So, and he's got some, you know, he's got some talent too. He's nice. He's a big, long, six two, hundred and ninety pound safety, and he's only eighteen years old. So he's wow. just going to continue to develop. Yep. Yeah, he's got the frame to put a little bit more on and be. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and to be that long, lanky, big safety. So anyway, yeah, yeah it was a blast. It, it it's actually kind of interesting to bring that up because it really this, my 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 family and my boys are everything to me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it kind of <laughs> cut into my hunting time quite a bit this year. Yeah. Yeah, I, well, I, I I was thinking that as I was seeing you travel because I mean those college games are those are Saturdays, you know what I mean? That's yeah. like prime hunting time, you know. I, I rarely ever hunted on a weekend, which when you work full time and you don't have weekends, yeah, you know it was one of those things where if Ty's team was playing a long ways away, and because I knew he's not starting or playing on a on a in a game, if I knew he was playing and, and got to get on the field, I wasn't going to miss, but. You know, he was, here was the deal. And his head coach said it in a press conference late. He was one play away for seven or eight games of having to be the starter. So we always had to be there because we just knew all it'd take would be one play. Yeah. 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 That's, that's cool, man. I mean, you're going to have some busy, some busy, uh, some busy hunting seasons here for the next couple of years while he, while he uh, chases that dream, which will be, which will be awesome. Right. And it's something that I'm, you know, I went through this year and I knew it was going to be way different because I put so much time into these mountain whitetails just to get a crack Right. that, you know, I really worked hard when I had the time to try to have all my ducks in a row. And I know we'll get at this later when we talk about the season, but um, no, it's a new equation for me to tackle, but I have some things that I'm going to change up this year ahead of time to even be more efficient with my time right nice and yeah i definitely want to see what those what those things are because i think everyone probably in different ways feel like they don't have enough time whether it's just their job or whether it's you know kids playing high school sports or in your case college yep. sports and stuff like that yep. but before we jump into whitetails man i'm excited because i'm actually going to be coming out to your neck of the woods in september i drew me an idaho elk tag and i am pump for my first kind of my first uh soiree into the uh into the idaho mountains so pretty excited for that's that. awesome do you, do you know happen to know what uh region that you drew in yeah i'm in panhandle a and i want to say <laughs> it's over um oh man i can't think of the name of like the 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 range that's over there maybe is it zone four maybe that's over there yeah you're panhandle a you have all of northern idaho to hunt and that's where I hunt. So you and I will be hunting in the same zone for elk. Nice. Yeah. I'll have to pick your brain. Cause I, I mean, I'll certainly share with you where I'm going to be at my, I think I mentioned to you, my buddy moved out to your neck of the woods last year and because he was a non-resident, he couldn't get an elk yep. tag. So he basically just scouted and he went out right. and called for guys all season pretty much. And, uh, he was asking me to come out. I was like, Hey, you know, be great if you could come out this September. And I wasn't even thinking of buying a tag to be honest with you. Cause I knew, you know, sometimes Idaho can be, you know, tough to get a tag. And, uh, and I was like, you know, I was like, ah, eh. someone texted me. He's like, Hey, you're getting an Idaho elk tag. And I was like, when they go on sale and there's like today they're on sale. And I was like, this is like 11 <laughs> o'clock. And I right. didn't talk to my wife or anything. I just hopped on and I was like, I logged in and like waited. And I was like, Oh, there's probably like no chance I'm going to get one. And sure enough, I like my number came up and I got one. <laughs> so that was I like, think you, 
I think you texted me about that when you got it. <laughs> I did. Like I had no plan. Yeah. Like the planning that went into that was all of like 30 seconds. I was like, yeah, sure. I'll buy a tag. Let's do this. <laughs> you know, well, that's awesome. You're, you're going to actually get to see exactly what I hunt whitetails in. Then. I know I'm excited. I'm excited about that. Um, you know, I would love to make it out there sometime just to, you know, hunt whitetails. My, to be truthful with you, to be candid, my buddy Wilson, who lives out there now, he's excited to hunt elk, but he's a, you know, coming from PA and stuff like that. Like he's a diehard whitetail hunter. And so right. he's all about, you know, and he's just like super stoked to hunt mountain whitetails. Like that's all he's kind of talked about since he's moved out there. Um, and it's just like super pumped for his first season to be able to, uh, to be able to do that. And I told him, I was like, Hey, I was like, you know, Troy Pottinger lives out there. I was like, you got to listen to the podcast that he's, that he's done. I was like, not just this one. I was like, but a bunch of other ones that he's done. I was like, cause that guy is the guy for that area. You know, if you want to know about hunting mountain whitetails, I was like, you aren't going to find a better resource than that. So he might stalk you at some point, try to find you at a watering hole, but, uh, but, but, but don't blame me for that. I won't. And you know, if he's, if he's, if he wants to, he could even look into my boot camps that I teach. Yeah, actually I'll give him a heads up. I'll give him a heads up on that. And, uh, it, cause it, I think it would be good for him to, to do that. And he's, he's meeting a lot of people out there. He actually works for, uh, uh, Pacific game calls out there, um, making okay. everything from like duck calls, the, you know, goose calls, the turkey calls, elk calls, whatever, whatever it is. Right. Um, you know, so he has so a pretty good making some connections. Yeah. 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 He's, he's pretty, he's, he's got a good group of guys that he can kind of pal around with and kind of show him the ropes and stuff like that out there. But as far as white tails, you know, th there's not a guy that's out there that I would turn him on to aside from you, as far as like, if he really <laughs> wants to know the ins and outs. So I'm definitely going to put that, uh, put that bug in his ear, but not to kind of beat up the elk hunting stuff, man. I want to jump into, into some whitetail, uh, hunting with you. And so I just really kind of want to start, man. You kind of foreshadowed it a little bit when we were talking about your, your boy playing some college ball. How was your, how did your season kind of end up? You know, I know you and I talked this fall. Um, you had some high hopes, you know, for this, this season and, and we're gonna, you know, getting ready to get after it. Cause I think you just kind of wrapped up elk hunting at that point. How did things kind of right. pan out for you? Well, um, you know, I, I hunt public land, so without getting into too much detail, and, and I really I really don't want to, my, tar my best target buck, my number one target buck by far, um, ended up getting shot early. Mm. Um, he was a buck that lived on uh, some reservation ground, too, and those the reservation guys can hunt a lot earlier with rifles, like July. Okay he ended up getting killed in late July, early August. So I had to switch gears and, you know, go to plan B on that. And was also, you know, running to Montana all the time, watching my son play football. So the early, the early archery season, I killed a really nice bull very early on per, I mean, I, I had some really good elk this year mm -hmm. in some spots. And my goal this year was to kill a big white tail, maybe two, but kill one big one, one of my targets, and then try to kill two bulls. Mm -hmm. And I had one of those really good summers of, of uh, scouting and uh, last summer, and I found some really good bulls. So what happened to me was is I hunted elk pretty hard early season, and because my big target had got the big buck I really wanted to kill, it got whacked. Um, I on purpose kind of spent more time on elk early season and decided to. Mm -hmm. um, so then I um, got into October. Um, my business that I do with my bulldozer was so busy with everybody moving here that I didn't get a hunt a lot. And then when November hit, I dove back into the whitetail woods and started looking for, you know, that next top one or two targets that I wanted to kill in either Eastern Washington or Idaho. I didn't care. Right. And I ended up, um, are you getting a little feedback there? Uh, no, I'm okay. Okay, good. I'm not sure if you're going to hear it. As long as you're not hearing it on your end, I'm getting a tiny bit. Okay. So anyway, I dove into, uh, dove back into the big white tails and every free chance I had to hunt. Um, I got on a buck that, that my son actually almost killed the year before. Uh, before Ty went off to college and he was kind of a buck that just meant a lot to us because he had, we'd been on him for three years and hadn't killed him yet. And big buck, I mean, big six, seven year old, he's either mm -hmm. six or seven. 
giant bodied mountain whitetail that we just, I mean, I got a set of sheds off of him in a single. And he kind of became my target because he was in a location that allowed me to hunt him more frequently. So basically closer to home. Mm-hmm. And I could still go and do all the football stuff on the weekends. Got it. So I dove into this buck and uh, got after him pretty heavy in late archery season. And go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so like what was, um, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to ask this. So I I guess, how did you, how did you locate him first? Was he, was he one, of course, I I guess you kind of knew of previously, and then he just kind of became the the next one on the list, or did you kind of have to like relocate him, if you will? Um, He's a buck that, he's a buck that there's nobody in this state, nobody in the state next to me that would ever pass with a bow and arrow or a rifle. I mean, he's a stud and he's a buck that I'm a guy that likes to have a stud in my hip pocket that may not be my, I mean, the the truth is the buck that got killed in August or early, late July, early August. um, That buck that got killed on the reservation ground, that buck was not on reservation ground. Also, he was running both, places Mm. I could hunt and then he and places I couldn't hunt. But anyway, all that to say that buck was unreal. Mm. And so then I went from an unreal buck to a hell of a buck. Um, And this is a buck that I have a ton of intel on. This is one of those bucks that you always keep around and you even try to kill him. Like my son tried to kill him last year just because he's that good of a deer and he was huntable. And so I had a lot of past intel on him. I know his area very well. Um, the genetics in there, I, I've actually got, I'm sitting down in my man cave right now and I've got one, two, three, four, five bucks from that same mountain range hmm. that this buck came from. So it's one of my favorite areas, but it's a huge area. We're talking miles and right. miles right. Of, of good genetics. So anyway, um, I did have a lot of past with him. I keep tabs on him. I had put Three years ago, counting this season, three seasons ago, I had uh, found a a set off of him when he was either four and a half or five and a half. And when I found that set, that's actually how I located him. Hmm. I found the set of sheds that, and this is, you know, important to talk about as far as what we're going to get into later with shed hunting. It was one of those early, he shed early and he shed before the snow moved him. And I knew when I found that set based on the snow levels that year and why I'd found that set there, I knew that he'd shed early because um, on camera, he was bald. Mm -hmm. He had, you know, he was bald pretty early. Mm -hmm. And anyway, all that to say where I found the set, which wasn't necessarily where I had him on camera, but I was getting him in two different places. Well, where I found the set told me where he was really hiding out. Right. Right. It was showing me where he was hiding out. So what I immediately did is when I found that set, I think I found it over a three to five day period. And Tyson actually was with me when I found the second side. And uh, I told Ty, I said, well, you can see where he's living now, son. He's, you know, he's in a spot that most guys won't work to get to. And that's why he's here. And I could tell by just how the condition that shed was in that it had been there for a while. Like it had been through the winter a while, meaning he shed early and he gave away his hidey hole to me, Hmm. his hunting, you know, his spot where he's going to get away from all the pressure. Right. So the, I'm sorry, go ahead. ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, so I immediately told Ty that I said, I'll set up, I'll kill him up here. We'll kill this deer in here. So you've kind of know where his hidey hole is based on, you know, finding that shed in the time of year that he would have, that he would have shed that. Exactly. What, what were the what were the hunts like for him then this year? As far as like, I mean, you had you had to have felt pretty good going into any hunt for that particular deer this year, just given right. what you what you knew about him. Right. This deer last year was a dead deer, and we have the footage of it. Ty has six minutes of beautiful HD footage of him. Wow. My son is so uh, mature above his years as a whitetail hunter. He did not shoot that deer because that deer did not give him a perfect broadside shot. Hmm. And my son's just like, that's how my kid is. He, hmm. he, ta- he takes great shots only. And he, de- you know, he just really loves white tails and respects them. So he doesn't want to take a half ass shot. Right. And when we watched that footage, he goes, dad, you'd have killed that deer when he turned right there. Wouldn't you? And I said, I, 
knowing me, I would have snuck an arrow in right when he turned. Yes. <laughs> so now we're honest about that stuff. And then he's like, dad, I should have just killed him. And I said, well, I said, here's the bottom line with Mount Whitetail, son. You ain't going to see him five times. Right. And, and if you do have that opportunity and you do feel confident with how good of a shot you are, then, I mean, you had it, you know, you, the, the thing is the opportunity was one second. Right. So it would have had to have been perfect. And he had him at like 22. Well, that buck walked out of Ty's life that year. And I was actually, I had actually already tagged out. So I put Ty. So let's back up to when I initially told Ty a couple of years ago, I'm going to set up up here. I built a big mock scrape up there. I laid everything out for those deer. And we instantly started getting some great age class in that spot because we found that it was a spot the deer were comfortable. Mm-hmm. I ended up killing that big six-year-old four by four that was 150 inch four by four. Hmm. so ty got to hunt the six by five the one i'm talking about this year that i was after Mm -hmm. and ty had him and couldn't get a shot well that was the one time he saw him in the daylight then we ran out of season so now fast forward to this year i'm on i'm back in after that deer same location same big scrape i put in two years previous when i first found the sheds and started getting deer to use it and just went right back in there and it was pretty incredible just like clockwork from the year before when ty had a shot what almost got a shot at him that big deer due to pressure moved into there late november Hmm. and started bedding very close to us just like he had done the year before and the year before that the reason we found his sheds up there was because he'd done the same thing right he was hiding out in a great bedding area where nobody was really getting to him so we knew we were close. I knew I'd be close this year. Um, the other spot that I get him on camera early season was over a mile away. Okay. So that's how I knew in the past the dates of where I of when he shed those antlers. Okay. And it's nothing for a mountain whitetail, even in the late season at night, to walk a mile just to go feed. Right. Nothing to him. Nothing at all. Yeah. So so anyway, we're putting all the pieces together. I just knew I was going to kill that deer this year. Like, not like cocky about it. Just the guys doing the same thing three years in a row. Right. And like I you, said, you had multiple years of pattern on him, like where he's done yeah, the same thing I, over. And, 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 yeah, those, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say to where he's done the same thing year over year for three years. Yeah. Now it's just a matter yeah. of and, like matching up the time you can actually get into the woods with the conditions that he's going to want to use to be in that particular spot where you can actually kill him. Right. Right. So what I did is set up all my little bit of free time I had left into those days I needed to. Right. And I mean, I'm sure your listeners want to hear what happened. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to, I want to hear what happened. Like I'm kind of (laughs) waiting. So the bottom line is I should have been a hero this year. And this deer was, you know, it meant a lot to me. Ty's off playing football. Ty should have killed him last year. Ty's like, Dad, go kill him. You get him killed. And I said, yeah, he's he's going to get killed. I'm going to get after him. And anyway, the setup is awesome. The way I enter it, the way we get there, the way the wind works, it's almost bulletproof. Hmm. So this is one of those spots. And when you have community-type scrapes set up, that deer will frequent and want to frequent over and over, you can hunt a spot like this more than once. Yeah. Especially if you're if, in my stand, in my entrance, I go around the mountain on purpose. I enter the long way in. I use the wind and the thermal every day, and I can literally loop in way under these deer, come all the way up the backside of a spine of a ridge and loop around and use the prevailing on the high part of the ridge plus the thermal they can never smell me they literally can't unless i have one specific wind direction that i rarely get Hmm. and i know that about that spot and it's probably one it's turned into the last couple years as far as just viewing white tails doing their natural thing because they have no idea you're there Mm -hmm. it's just incredible yeah daylight my scrape gets hammered uh they travel this spot it's a bedding area 50 from 50 yards away from me that goes for 200 more yards in a 200 yard square is a bedding area. Hmm. And it's, it's as thick as it gets. Hmm. So 
it's just everything you ever want. And I've cracked the code on how to get in there. <laughs> so I go in and I check my camera and sure enough, the dude is on my scrape and shows up for the first time up in there because they understand he didn't live there until late November every year. Right. Right. Until he got pushed. Until he gets the pressure. Yeah. And in mountain country, when animals get pressure, they, they get pushed to usually higher ground. Not always. Mm -hmm. It depends on the equation. If they have a piece of private, they can hide out on, then they will. But he got pushed higher elevation like he'd been the last few years. And, you know, he's an old deer, so he'd probably been doing that for three to four years. Mm-hmm. I got excited about him when I found those sheds because he had, you know, real good genetics, real solid. Yep. You know, he's he's not a booner, but he's a big 155, 160-inch deer. Yeah. And, and a huge body, probably 275 pounds. I joke you not. Just wow. a monster of a body. Yeah, it's a big Literally deer. dwarfed every deer on the mountain, <laughs> body-wise. And the one I killed up there last year had a 28-inch neck. Jeez. And in trail camera pictures, this deer that I hunted this year is bigger than my buck last year that had a 28 inch neck. Good Lord. Yeah. I mean, he is a freaking tank and the genetics. That's why I hunt that. I love the genetics there. Yeah. I mean, not just the antlers. I love the bodies on these old bucks in there. So anyway, I got in there early on and I think it took me two or three sits to have him show up. And it was the first time, and nobody's heard all of this yet other than my son (laughs) and my wife and my other son. So this is quite the, this is quite the endeavor, especially with a mountain buck. Right. The very first time he comes rolling up through, I have this deer broadside at 20. (laughs) I go to draw my bow. I had been sitting, that was an all bear. And I had been sitting in an ice, uh, uh, rain, an ice, an ice, not an ice, like a ice slash rainstorm for yeah. half the day. Yeah. And then, it got, and then it got cold as hell. So throughout the day that day, I had to draw my bow and break the ice off of it <laughs> two or three times. I literally, when I didn't think anything was around, had to move in my clothing and it was warm layered clothing. I had to move on purpose to break the ice off me because I knew if I drew on a buck with that ice on me, they're going to hear it. They hear me. Yeah. It'd be over. Yeah. And my deer are skittish. They get hunted hard by predators. So they're skittish. This big dude comes in and starts working his way across this spot where I'm set up. And he's headed right, right underneath my scrape. And I think he was just walking underneath it because he's so used to either walking through it, checking it or walking by it to scent check it. It's just ingrained in him. Yep. And he's coming by and he's sorry, gang. We had a little technical difficulty there. We're just going to pick it up here where we, uh, where we were cruising through. So he he's coming through that scrape is what you mentioned. I think it's the last thing you mentioned. He's rolling through there. It's kind of a a habit. He came under. Yeah. Yeah. He came underneath it. He come downwind of it. Yeah. About five, 10 yards. So I I'm all hooked up. I I'm, I, I like to draw on these bucks a little early and he's at 20 and that's too late for me in my book. But anyway, I go to draw. I'm three quarters of the way through my draw. And I couldn't, it just blew my mind. It was so cold and so iced. I have no idea how it happened, but my arrow made a noise on my rest. Oh, man. Like a tiny screech. Yep. Oh, yeah. Every, I, and it was, I, I could hear it. And, and I've got seal skin on my rest. I've got the quietest setup you've ever heard. And I want to back up to this because it's lesson learned. And I used to do something that always would keep this from happening when my bow would ice up. And I didn't do it this year. Just not because I didn't think about it. It's just been a long time since I needed to. Right. And anyway, I want to get back to what I used to do and what I ended up doing later. And it'll all come together in the story of this. This deer's this deer has nine lives. (laughs) This deer has nine lives. Anyway, the tiniest noise. And you know what that mountain buck did when he barely heard something that wasn't right? So it was game over for that day. Gone. Yeah. He jumped about 20 feet to the right, literally just launched, looked around, you know, and that's, that's how they are when they get hunted by cougars. Mm -hmm. He just launched himself to the right, wondered what the noise was, looked around and he literally walked away from me. I went to full draw. I put my pin on him. And he walked away from me at 30 dead away with his ass right at me. Hmm. And he just, and he just walked off and he looked back a couple of times and he's gone. 
into the timber. Didn't run, never blew, never made a noise. He just <laughs> did his thing. He heard a noise that wasn't right and, and was gone. Right. So just for me, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just, I was just going to say, like, I'm sitting here just like, I, I'm, I'm picturing it in my mind and like, it's making me nauseous just thinking about it. <laughs> I was, I was, it was, it was insane because that, that to me, that deer was dead. Yeah. And, and, and it gets better. This isn't the end of this buck. All right. Story. So, all right. So, <laughs> the, so, so that happens, right? Yeah. Like, I'm sure you're right. thinking, I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but like the way I think, especially, you know, you have predators out there. What we, what I have in Pennsylvania is just like insane amounts of hunting pressure, like human hunting pressure. Right. And, and you do. Yeah. Yes, you do. Yeah. And it's, it's crazy. So it's usually for me, it's like, if I see a deer one time, I'll give you an example. I might even text you about this. But I had a, a target deer show up to a primary or a community scrape and I timed it right. Cause I was watching annual data and I knew it was about a three day window. I was going to get the first uh, mature buck was going to daylight the first time, like in this kind of three day window. It happens historically at this specific spot almost right. year, like yearly. I timed yep. it right. It was, I don't know. It was, it was like the 16th of October or something like that. And sure enough, he showed up. I couldn't tell which buck he was because he had his head behind some brush and I should have drawn in advance of him, like clearing the brush and then figured out who he was whenever he stepped out because he had a very similar frame. There were two eight points that were in there. One that was clearly like a three, like a three or a four year old for around here, which is a good age class deer for where I live and really long, really long times. There was a younger deer that was probably only two that had the same exact frame, only his tines were shorter. You know what I mean? And so I wanted to make sure I knew which deer it was. And so I didn't draw in time. He ended up facing me and I was stuck not being able to get drawn. And he, as I moved to kind of try to resituate myself to let him walk, to try to get him in a position where I could draw, he saw the slightest movement and just kind of snapped his head around and then was gone. And that deer never showed up to that spot again the rest of the season, like gone, like don't know where, I mean, he may have got killed during gun season, but during archery season, I mean, that scrape is like the scrape for that area. Never again. Did he show up? That was it. He didn't like it. No, that was it. Game over. Yeah, he, he bugged out. Yeah. And then with this deer, I read his body language and it rarely happens for me, but this was a very odd noise. That, that I could tell from his body language, he didn't know what it was. So he just, you know, gathered and jumped just out of reaction. And then he walked away mm -hmm. and he didn't give me a shot. He walked ass straight to me away. So I really thought about it and I sat there real quiet and I was just freezing cold that day. I, we have a very wet cold in mm -hmm. this country. And when you're an extra 2000 feet up on a mountain, it's always 20, 10 to 20 degrees colder. Right. Than it is down in the valleys. So I don't know what the exact temperature was. I did not look. I was wrapped up in that deer, but I was, I realized when I got done and he left, I realized I was like shivering from how cold it was after the fact. Right. And I was thinking about that deer and I thought, you know, this is his, this is his true late November, early December hideout always because he's comfortable there. There's a chance he might come back because of the noise that I made. It wasn't like a clank or a right. It's just a weird noise my arrow made up with ice on it. Yeah. It was it was it was hard to explain the weird noise it made. It was kind of like a screech, a little bit of a weird screech. Anyway, so I decided right then I had some options. I could either go hunt some other deer, but due to my son's football schedule i mean they're making a playoff run mm -hmm. you know they end up in the national championship i'm thinking i i probably better stick it out and try to kill this deer before the season's over because i th i'm gonna watch my cameras obviously and see if he turns back up right he was back in there a day i think it was a day later <laughs> maybe two days later in the daylight at 9 30 a.m wow so game back on um, you know how it goes. You, you, you lick your wounds and you don't let it bother you and yeah. you either move on to another deer, but this was like, all right, uh, this is a blessing. This, this guy's going to give me another chance at him because he didn't know I was a human there hunting. He right. heard something he didn't like, uh, he, he give it a little time and then he's back in there. And the first picture I got back of him was right in my scrape. <laughs> I mean, in the licking branches, the first picture I get. 
That's he's just picture. hammering the Lakers. And this is December now. Okay. All right. So, so we're, we're, we're out of, no- we're out of November, November, November at this point. We're, we're early December now. And, and when I drew on him was like right around the 1st of December. So now it's like December 3rd or 4th or somewhere around okay. there. Uh, and anyway, so I'm like, okay, I'm back on him. I'm going to get another chance. And I remember calling Ty and talking to Ty about him. Ty's like, dad, you'll kill him now. He's, he's not even, he has no idea that you were hunting him if he's back there that quick. Cause that's, that's kind of how our mountain bucks are. If they happen to be right back, they don't know what it was and they didn't smell me. Yeah. For all they, for all they know, like they just heard something they didn't like and wasn't sure what it was. It was just more of a precautionary, like, uh, oh, I'm not sure what that is. I'm, I'm going to jump. All right. I'm just going to go ahead and get out of here. Cause that was kind of weird. Yeah. Yeah, and I think they have to do that a lot with predators. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so anyway, I got back in on him. And again, it's I'm going to kill this deer. And this time I'm going to do everything right. I'm going to draw earlier if I see him. And I believe in my memory, because I hunt so much, is not perfect, but I believe it was maybe two to three more sits later. So that would have been equivalent of either a half day or a full day Mm -hmm. on each sit. I had him again. I was just about ready to get out of the stand. And where I hunt, I'm in dark timber. When I get out of my tree stand, there's still 10 minutes of legal light left to hunt on the can- on the clock. Right. But I hunt in some of the darkest timber you'll see in some of these spots where it's just these deer think it, you know, they feel safer. Yep. And this scrape I have, it's kind of wicked where I hunt. I'm on the edge of really dark timber, but the scrape on purpose is out on the edge of a more lighted spot. There's a little more, there is, it's open there to where some light can get in. Mm -hmm. And I do that on purpose. And right when I was thinking about gathering my goods and he hadn't, wasn't going to come in may, you know, by then all the leaves are off like this. We have, we have a lot of ocean spray out here Mm -hmm. and it's just a leafy green leaf. The deer just love it. Well, all the leaves are off now. So if you're in the timber, and you got ocean spray mixed in, which is a great bedding, bedding, bedding brush and a great brush to build scrapes off of. It's kind of a viney, big, tall, stemmy brush. Anyway, all the leaves are off by then in December. And I look down through the ocean spray patch and I see his, I see his frame. Oh, man. Yeah. And it's him. And I instantly, when I see a deer, I instantly feel the wind on my face. I just sense, I just auto, automatic, okay, where's the wind? And just thinking that yeah. the wind was blowing, the wind was blowing at a 45 across him up to me. Hmm. Was he coming from so your I, right or your left? He's dead, dead right out in front of me this time coming okay. from his thickest, nastiest, uh, North face bedding area. Okay. And steepest. Okay. And I have tracked him in the past, backtracked him. So, so let me rewind last year, looking for his last year's set of sheds that I still haven't found. I had backtracked him off a camera. One day I went to check my camera and he'd been there like six hours before me. Hmm. And this is early January last year, not this season, but the season before. Mm -hmm. So I tracked him all over, figuring out what he was doing last year. Sure enough, this year, this December, on my second chance at him, he comes out of that same spot. I backtracked him last year. Hmm. So I knew what he was coming up out of. And the wind was 45 and across his nose up to me to a 45 and if he come into my scrape he would be 18 yards in front of me literally dead and he was on the perfect path to do it so he he looked real calm real real chill did not i knew he couldn't win me is my point knew he wasn't going to win me and the downhill thermal sucking wind off the back side of me down the mountain so it's money off the thermal too, plus the prevailing is money. Nice. So he starts doing what old bucks do and very careful bucks. He starts working his way up towards my scrape. And I can see he's actually on that trail, that trail through that ocean spray patch. And it's just thick brush for your listeners to imagine. It's seven, eight feet high, but there's some trails in it. And I'm up high enough. I can see him down in there because there's no leaves. And he's working his way up and he's on the trail and he's going to come right to my scrape. I knew it. So he does, it. he comes working his way up. And when he starts to get within 10 yards of my scrape, I knew he was going to come around this Christmas tree size tree and walk right up to my scrape. Well, I drew early. Hmm. He comes around, comes into the scrape. Perfect. Straight on. (laughs) 
puts his head up, checks the licking branch, just kind of does a sniff, puts his head up again, does it again, stands straight on, stands there, <laughs> stands there, stands there. If I had to guess, it was two minutes. <laughs> Jeez. So, so I just chill out. I, I'm at full draw. I set my cam on my knee real careful, and I've got that real quiet clothing on. So I just rested it on my knee, and I relaxed, and I stayed at full draw. It's no joke. It had to have been at least two minutes, and it's cold as hell. And now we're down to about five, six minutes left of the day to get him shot. And I, and I knew I had about 10 when I first saw him, so I'm like, he's dead. He then proceeds for me straight at me, and I have one more Christmas tree, and he's walking straight at me, brisket, nose pointed right at me. And he comes up to this Christmas, and I call it a Christmas tree because it's about the size of a Christmas tree, mm -hmm. about 12 feet high, about a 12-foot high tree, uh, a spruce or a dug fir, one or the other. Can't remember what it was, but steps out in front of my stand. And I know he's either got to go right or left around it. And I'm still sitting there at full draw, so I get ready. So I bring the belt real slow because he is close. <laughs> he's probably 18 yards now behind that tree. And... He goes on the downhill side of the tree. It's a, it's a mellow slope. And he comes out broadside, and I'm ready. I got him. He's a dead deer. I mean, I'm on him. Bring the pin down. Man, I get excited. I mean, it kind of works me up thinking about this. <laughs> so, so I go from his shoulders down, lower the pin down on him, and he's dead. That's what I'm thinking. You're done. And I just, man, I get calm. And I let it go. And I hear right in the snow. <laughs> and I see him spin around and run straight back out that trail. <laughs> and I know immediately that sound was not good. Right. Because I, when you shoot him that close, you hear it hit him. Oh, yeah. And all I heard was, and I had over a foot of snow there. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. I just said, are you shitting me? I said to myself, you got to be kidding me. Are you kidding me? I just had this guy for probably two or three minutes, had no idea I was here, walked right in underneath me, and I think I just missed him. Well, wow. So I'm thinking, well, it's either that or I shot through him so clean that it just, he's dead down there, you know. Right. And I put the pin center mass on his lungs. Hmm. And... I'd like to tell the rest of the story and then back up and, and, and let you know what I, what I truly think happened. Yeah. Yeah. For so sure. I hunt, I, I hunt pretty high. Yep. I get down and I know I got to go check my arrow and by then it's starting to get kind of dark. So I grab my headlamp out of my, I leave it in my side pocket of my bibs and I pull it out and I turn it on. I can still see good, but I thought I want to see real good. Cause you know, I'm going to be tracking blood maybe. Right. But I, but I knew what I heard was not good. Because I've shot so many of them, I knew it was, I, and I, the last time I missed one was 2011 and my son was with me and it did the same thing. No noise, you know, just a, like an arrow before it hits a target noise, Yeah. but doesn't hit anything. And because I had so much snow, there was no impact noise. Hmm. So anyway, I get down there and it's closer than I think. It's close. Like I look back at my tree stand, I'm like, holy shit, he's 15 yards, 16 yards. I looked down just past where he was, looked at his exact tracks where he spun and turned and ran off in his big old tracks in the snow there. And there's my arrow probably two, to, ah, probably four feet past me. I can see it down in the snow, but the, I can see my knock and my fletchings. Right. We grabbed the arrow, pulled out of the ground, pulled out of the snow. Sorry, get the right verbiage here. Pulled out of the snow. And no blood, nothing. <laughs> so I look at real close, look at, and as clean as can be with some ice on the broadhead, because I literally went down through the snow and hit into kind of an icy hard pack. Right. Didn't even get to dirt. Uh, I might have, might have had a little dirt on the end of the broadhead. It was, it just barely got, so it was, it was just a quiet, and I look at it super close and there's one brown hair on it. One one strand of hair in this in my headlamp and i'm looking at it real close i'm like you gotta be sh kidding me <laughs> so you do what you always should do i get on his track i track him for 300 yards 
he went right back to where I thought he was bedding and passed it. Hmm. And I went, I went super slow, made sure there was no blood. I did not hit him. Went all the way back, had to figure it out. It's dark now. I step it off to my tree to where he was actually standing was 15 and a half, 16 yards. Hmm. I shot him for 20. I'm up high. I should have heart shot him and I didn't. And I usually always heart shoot him. And I didn't even think about it. Hmm. And he just got under me. Yeah. So did you, did you think the arrow did, did it fly over his back? I'm assuming. Oh, I went right over him. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. hundred percent. And I, I was shooting him for what I thought was 20. Mm -hmm. He was four yards closer. I'm up high, steep angle. I shot right over him. Yeah. Yeah. That's... He, he, he gathered just enough when the, when he heard the bow, just enough to get under it. Yeah. And if you heart shot, if you heart shoot there, you probably still catch both of them, top, top, top of his lungs, at least both of them. I get both lungs. If I heart shoot him instead of center mass and his center punch in his lungs. Exactly. Yeah. That's where I screwed up. And I know better. Yeah. I know better when they're closer, that whole two to three minutes standoff at full draw. I probably wasn't as sharp mm -hmm. thinking about how close he was other than just get him killed. Right. Yeah. I, I don't remember like being out of breath or I don't remember being tired from holding my bow. I had so much adrenaline. It was like the time was like really slow, but I don't remember like having a strain. I just flat out missed it. Right. I mean, you know, truthfully, it's like, I, I hate that story for you, you know, cause it's just like those types of things are just, you know, I mean, they're terrible. You did everything right. You had everything kind of the way it needed to be and spent time with that deer. You knew where he was going to be like all, everything was right. You know, and just, you know, those small little things, but I'm glad for the folks who are listening to this, because I think a lot of people, you know, see guys like you that, you know, people hold in high regard, you know, as far as, you know, being able to get it done or like Andre or whoever, it's like, everyone's human, <laughs> you know, it's like, it, it, it happens to the best of them. You know what I mean? Like some, uh, some days you yeah. eat the bear, some days the bear eats you, and, you know, and it's, and it's, yeah. you do it long enough. Doesn't matter how much of a stone cold killer someone is eventually you're going to have a bad turn of luck. That's just not going to, you know, that things aren't going to fall in your favor on a given day. So I hate it for you, but I think it's kind of refreshing for folks out there listening that say like, Hey man, this guy's got tons of big deer on his wall, knows how to get it done, gets it done regularly. And sometimes it doesn't break his way. So maybe I can be a little easier on myself whenever it doesn't break my way, so to speak. For sure. And you know, it made me think the first thing that, got in my mind as I'm walking away that night. I was really disappointed for my son because I I always it's important to me as a father for him to set a good example and and honest to God get stuff done just to just to let you know let him know the old man can still get her done. So it bothered me a little bit. It's like right. damn I failed. Right. And then I started thinking about this. I've been on a bunch of podcasts in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. The last deer I missed was 2011. Tyson was with me. I shot over a velvet buck, kind of did the same thing. I didn't go down to the heart like I should have, and I I just didn't do it right. Mm -hmm. I mean, no excuses. It was very humbling, and I'm walking out of there, and I just kind of looked up to God, and I said, hey, this is good for me because it really stopped and made me think about, are you truly as sharp as you used to be? And if you're not, are you make it, you know, what are you, I started analyzing everything mm -hmm. and thinking, are you really at your a game or is this just something that teaches you to stay humble, right? Stay humble. That buck just beat you guys again. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then I, you know, I always try to, I always try to think about the positive, but the truth of the matter is, uh, I talk about it all the time. I like slam dunk shots. Mm -hmm. I only take slam dunk shots. That's why I kill a lot of my deer. Well, guess what? Even on a slam dunk shot, you still might miss because you're human. Yep. Yeah. I had a slam dunk shot. I had that deer. And it just humbled me and made me really think, you better be grateful. And I'm sitting here right now with all these bucks around me. And I'm thinking, you know, I am very grateful for all the one slam dunks that I've got that I made it happen, but this did, and it does, it motivated me right? because I thought you just went from hero to zero. Right. <laughs> and, and I'm not so, I'm not so concerned about that with uh, 
public. Right. Um, I'm my son means a lot. This deer was a buck that, you know, ties like dad kill that deer. Yeah. And we have a bond that's unreal. And we have a whitetail bond that I can't even explain. That kid has been with me since he's so little, it's unreal. <laughs> so so it was hard for me in that aspect of I'm gonna have to call Ty and say I miss that son of a gun after screwing it up three or four days earlier. Right. So two screw ups. Yeah. Not one, two. I can chalk the first one up to gear. Right. I can't chalk that second one up other than to anything but my mistake, period. Right. I shot I shot too high. Right. But the one thing is though, is that, you know, always trying to look at the positive of things. It's man, it sets up for a really awesome redemption story. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, you know what I'm, I mean? I'm, it, and I'm already I'm already burning the mountain up trying to find shit. Right. Like and, and that's and that's a, and that's a great <laughs> transition actually, like the re- <laughs> to to move into like the next thing we want to talk about. So Right. So that, you know, that happens, you know, you 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 make peace with it however you need to make peace of it with it, right? To to kind of start thinking about next season. So now that everything's kind of over, you know, what are you doing to get ready for next season? Cause I know you mentioned earlier that you're changing things up a little bit and I'm curious what you meant by that. Well, well, I want to add this in yeah, and then we're going to go right into that. So because that happened, you're not going to believe this. That sucker shows up two days later. <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. I didn't hit him. <laughs> all he heard, all he heard was I sat there for a half hour after I tracked and came back and thought about this and thought you did not touch him. You hardly made any noise. You spooked him for the second time. There's no way he's coming back for the season's over, but you never know. Right. And that sucker come back. <laughs> did so you... I want to, I want the listeners to know I passed up three different bucks that I guarantee you nobody in the mountains is passing up on purpose. And I hunted that damn deer till the last second. Uh, I for the next 10 days. No, you did you have any more visuals of him from the from the tree or no? No. 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 And he and he part of it, part of the issue was the amount of free time I was afforded to be that I could actually hunt him was very minimal. Right. Yeah, and I, when I, I, say and I know, ten, when I, I say 10 days, when I say 10 days I wasn't out there 10 days. Right. Yeah, and I know that about you where it's, you know, some people might get the impression that you spend 60 days a year just strictly hunting or whatever. And I know no, you have, no, you have a no. career and other side things that you do and stuff like yes. that. So it's like, you know, yep. the deer that you are killing, you're doing it with pretty limited time because of, because of your career, you know, yeah, because of your I usually, profession. I usually care to kill a target buck in five hunts of on a max. Right. Yeah. I, if you had to ask me over the last 20 years, Troy, your target bucks, how many hunts did it take? One to five. Right. And that's where I should have been on this year, the fifth hunt on the second chance. Boom, dead. Yeah. yeah. Or sixth hunt, whatever it was, five or six, you know. Right. Which makes the postseason which, and kind of I, making your strategy all that much more important because of that. Like you got to right. be strategic yeah. whenever you're going to make, when you're trying to go in for a kill. Yeah. I've, I've already found a set off of one of the bucks I passed. Nice. And the bucks is stud. I mean, if I wanted, and this is what I want to share with listeners I don't think ever gets talked about. And I think a lot of guys need to hear this. Don't feel like you have to kill a buck to make everybody else happy. No. Yeah. hundred percent. We live in a, so, we live in a social media world, show and tell world. It's great in so many ways, but there's also some pressures that get added to guys that, that we don't, that aren't good. Mm-hmm. So it was very rewarding for me to know that I went, I was able to hunt that stand and literally, have two tremendous bucks for next year and the following year after that i've already found a set of sheds off of one of my up-and-comers and they are studs i mean they're beautiful deer that i literally just got to walk work by me hmm. before the season was over and after i had missed that big deer right and he did come in in the daylight a couple of days i wasn't there and come by. He come by in the daylight. He wasn't hanging around. He was just moving across the spot where that scrape is because it's between his bed and where he goes to feed quite a ways away. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have a good beat on him for, for next year now at this point as well. You know what I mean? It's like, you. I mean, at this point, you should have a pretty good, you know, you, you saw a couple bucks that you passed. Like so you should have a nice, 
a nice crew of deer to kind of take your take your pick from. But it sounds like this deer is going to be he's going to have the hex mark <laughs> for next year. It sounds like my son tells me now he's unkillable. <laughs> he, said, Dad, he said, Dad, if you miss him, he's unkillable. <laughs> Oh, now man. you know and here's the deal that's a deer we can only hunt late november because that's when he shows yeah on the public land that we have permit you know not permission that we have a right to get to and hunt there's there's some ground around there i can't hunt right but but you never know maybe he changes his pattern up I, i'll make sure and keep track of that scrape like i always do year round. yeah and then but if- he is just he's been a traditional late shower yeah that's cool man i mean so so what, so what's your plan? What's your plan now? How are you, how are you getting ready to kind of prep and get ready for the season? Cause you know, you did mention, right. you know, changing things up this year and stuff like that. So what's, right. what's that look like for you for postseason? Right. Right. So, so now we jump into what you wanted me to jump into as far as what happens after that season closed. Well, passed up some incredible young guys. And when I say young, we're talking three and four year olds that score from 135 to 150. Right. Yep. Um, that are going to be 160 class bucks if they get another year or two on them. Anyway, uh, right now, I immediately, as soon as I got evidence that sheds were on the ground, uh, fighting the snow, dealing with the the melt, I call it the melt because it it goes up in elevation as the days go. I mm-hmm. uh, got really got blessed this February with not a lot of snow. That's good. And it's early. It's an early melt. So I have been basically hammering good ground in my areas, not just this bucks area where I can get in, uh, and really break down and cover ground for sheds. But also I'm scouting when I shed hunt, I've done it for so long that I'm scouting too. And I'm pretty efficient at it. I was going to ask you that because a lot of guys will talk about, you know, they'll set days aside to shed hunt and they only shed hunt. And that's what they focus on because they miss sign when they're looking for sheds. And then the inverse right. is true that when they're scouting, they're so focused on finding sign, reading, you know, ta- or reading terrain and stuff like that, that where they're, they're going to certainly walk, walk by sheds. And I was curious if, if you're one of those guys that like certain days I'm shed hunting, certain days I'm scouting, or if you kind of do both at the same time. I, I, I feel like I'm really efficient at doing both at the same time because that's what I've trained myself to do for the last 30 years. Right. Okay. And I got serious about it in my twenties. And I had to teach myself to slow down, take everything in, do your shed hunting, do your patterns, do your grids, whatever, but don't miss a, don't miss a piece of sign. Mm -hmm. And the number one key to it is just slowing the hell down and taking it all in. I'm telling you, young guys, young men, a lot of testosterone fired up. I was the same way. You just want to freaking go kill it. Mm -hmm. What I do now is, you know, I made a team, you know, I had my, I turned my son into a hell of a, I mean, he was my teammate for years. And we would just grid stuff and find stuff that nobody thought we could find because we were so disciplined in our system and our grid. And then we added our shed dog, Hank, eight years ago, and he just became incredible. And now I've got shed, Hank's boy, Bo, that I'm training, who's Tyson's dog, who I ties at college. So I've always tried to say ahead of the curve, knowing that my son was going to go off to college. Mm-hmm. So I got a pup. Anyway, so now it's me and now it's me, the old man, I'm grandpa to Bo, the young dog, and I'm dad to Hank, my eight-year-old dog. So now it's us three. I'm training Bo. Hank is an incredible shed hunting partner that I have. And Tyson's gone now. So I've filled those voids a little bit and I'm still trying to be very efficient in what I walk, scout and pick up for sheds. And that's what I'm doing right now. Right. Um, Go ahead. No, I was going to, I was just going to ask like, you know, so that, that buck that you were hunting this year, obviously the right. sheds were pretty key to getting those, Great oppor- question. right. Getting yeah. those opportunities. Right. Because you, right. because of when he shed them, you knew, you know, that's where he was at before the snow comes and pushes him to his late season kind of hidey hole. If, if you will, <laughs> that was his kind of like November range after he got, gets pushed, well, you know, pressure wise. Let- right. Let me interrupt just a little because it's so, it's so much different in the mountains. Okay. So what this was is, yes, yes, you're you're laying it out, but I'm so nitpicky about this because I get so many questions about, I've heard everybody, you know, you're wasting your time trying to kill a buck where, where you find the sheds. No, right. That's what I wanted that, to, just, that's what I wanted to ask. It's, it's, it's total bull. It's total bull. If here's the, here's what you got to have. That's the key. Do your buck shed where you can hunt them. Number one. Mm-hmm. 
Number two, do your bucks shed early enough in the year compare in comparison to when you can kill them to identify where they're hiding out during that late season killing time? That's the key. Right. And and everybody has to stop and ask themselves that to be honest about whether or not a shed is productive to kill them the next year or not. Yeah. Yeah. And what happens to me out here is anybody that hunts in the Northwest knows whitetail bucks shed early and we get a hunt up until Christmas in Idaho with a bow and arrow. We get a hunt up until the 15th of December in Washington with a bow and arrow. So there you go. If I have a buck that sheds around Christmas up till January 15th, and if the snow levels have not moved him on a migration, mm-hmm. it, guess what? You're in business. I'm in business. Yeah. And that's why I have, and I'm going to count them right now, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's nine of them, ten of them right here above me, just above me sitting here that I have sheds to. Hmm. Yeah, see, that's that's interesting because I I wanted to ask that question because I feel like, you know, it certainly isn't Hold easier. Hold on, there's there's ten, eleven, twelve, there's thirteen counting the ones in the other room total. Right. So, you certainly don't have it easy in terms of like the terrain that you're hunting and stuff like that. But I almost feel like with the sheds, because of that snow and how it will how it will move them, I feel like yes. you can better kind of predict or better understand like. When you find a shed, what it's what it's related to, right? And I think absolutely. And I think here, like in PA or you know p- people in the Midwest or whatever, where we don't really have, I mean, we might get a bad snow or whatever the case is, but they're not necessarily migrating per se, right? And so if you find a shed somewhere late season, you know March, February, March, whatever whatever time you find it, there's probably a real good chance that's like the the late season area that he's either shifted back to that he might also summer at, but it, but he may not ever be there in the fall. And so like the one thing I've been well, watching, I'm sorry, go ahead. Here's my question to you though. Yeah. Can you hunt them in that late season or not? Yes or no? Uh, yes, you can in this, in this, where I live. Yeah. I can hunt till the end of January, essentially. Like I think the 29th was like my, my last day in certain parts of the state you can hunt to like the second week of January. So in part, I think, I think it's dependent somewhat on how, how quickly it gets cold and how quickly like the bad kind of winter weather moves in to a degree. You're basically saying the same thing as me. Yeah. Now, do, do guys really target that though? I don't think a lot of people do. No, they don't. I mean, a lot of the hunting's done kind of, you know, a lot of folks wrap it up right after gun season, even guys who bow hunt, you know, the, right. The, uh, the casual bow hunters, I guess maybe is one way to, one way to say it. Um, yep. but you know, the one thing that I've been trying to pay more attention to, and I think I sent this, uh, a video of this deer to you is one of those in, in an area that I've yes. been scouting in the, in the big woods and he's just a yep. hammer. Well, I saw him on, so he was a guy that showed up like in mid October, never saw him during the summer at all. He showed up mid October and stayed the entire fall. And then I got a picture of him on December 15th and then, so it's after gun season. So he made it. And then on the 22nd, I have another picture of him where he, he shed the left side of his antlers. And so he sounds just like, that sounds just like here. Yeah. And so he shed where I, where he was never around in the fall or summer until like mid fall, you know, and now he shed his antler in that area that he was at in the fall. So I feel like that deer like he shed early enough that he shed, I think where, well, I know he's there in the, he was there this year in the fall. He shed where I'm able to kill him actually during the rut and pre-rut. Yep. And you're, you're able to kill him in the pre-rut there, the rut and his late season hideout. It sounds like. Yeah. Cause it's right there on the cusp. Now I haven't had any other pictures of him post that, but that would be, that would be kind of that time frame. Well, that would be gun season essentially like right after gun season. So yeah, I, I think we have a, a small break in that part of the state um, where you can't hunt until cr- the day after Christmas for late season. So right. technically he would have already shed or started to shed right before that, that season would come back in. Right. But next year he might not shed till January 5th. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. That's, that's a buck that I would definitely, he's a great buck. He's a great buck for you. It's also a buck that I would definitely put stock into because of where his sheds are. Right. Yeah. I, I would be pounding that area to figure everything out about that area, not only to pick up his sheds, 
I would be figuring everything out about the doe family groups in that area, Mm -hmm. how they run the terrain, how all the deer adjust to each other and how the, and where the best community type hub scrapes are, because that's all going to make sense to you. And I think there's a window of opportunity for guys that want to target specific bucks. And I know it because I've got over a dozen of them in here that I can literally look at right now and count that because I found their shed antler first and I processed immediately what time of the year it was, how much snow I had, when did the big snow come, when did my deer get moved, this shed's definitely here before that because it's on the bottom of the snow. You know, all those factors put in, I thought, I can hunt this deer here, I can find him next year, and I've done it. Right, And and I think that's one of the distinctions in terms of, finding a shed and being able to hunt the same deer that you found the shed for, you know, wherever you found the shed is that it's not the only puzzle piece that you have. You have the shed, you have, you know, trail camera data of a deer. You understand, you know, there's, because you're killing the the age class of deer that you're killing you it's, you know, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you very rarely have less than a hand than a couple years of Intel on a specific deer before you try to go extract him essentially. Yeah, I and and I think what you're saying to me is, and I want to reiterate this just to get it right, is you're saying Troy, you usually have quite a few years of data before you kill it. Yeah, exactly. So it's not yeah, like I don't I, want I don't yeah. want the guy out there listening thinking like, right. hey, I found this shed and I think that he was here in the fall or right on the cusp of late season, so I think I can kill him. It's like, man, you're right. you're still just throwing a dart at a dartboard at that point. You know, the shed at that point well, doesn't well, th- go ahead. I'm yes. sorry. Yes, yes and no. But when I was younger, what taught me about these old monster mountain whitetails. And I was a shed hunting fool when I was young. The sheds, I end up killing these bucks in my late 20s, early 30s, some of these big dudes, because I started with the shed and I started thinking about, I really put it into thought instead of just throwing it out the window and saying it's a waste of time. How much snow did I have during what time of what month that would have pushed my deer or not? And that shed definitely got laid on the ground either before. And I always say this before the big snow come or after the big snow, if it's after the big snow, this shed's laying somewhere where they got, they migrated two or three or five miles away after the big snows of say January, February come, then I know that it's a waste of time. Right. But to back up to those guys learning and out shed hunting, all I'm saying is stop and really think about, okay, just found this fresh shed. Let's say you're out this weekend Mm -hmm. and you're out shed hunting and you find a buck you've never seen before. And he's a stud. The first thing I do when I find a shed is I can look at it and tell if it's been there two months or a month or a week. Right. right? Yep. Based on if the snow has been on top of it, if it's saturated with uh, water, you can really look at the color. You know, you can just tell. And if, for example, I found a gr- that great buck I was telling you about that was under me this year at that same spot that I just found last week, when I found his shed, one was out on the south. It was really it was right on the corner of a southern face bending into a north on a ridge that was only 50 yards across, and it went from north to south, which is insane. Hmm. But that's how sharp the ridge, the bluff was around the ridge. Right. So from north to south, 50 yards. I find this shed tines up on the very edge of the sunlighted south where there's no timber, no snow on it at all. Hmm. I look 15 feet to 20 feet away where there was some timber shadow and the sun couldn't get to it. And there's a foot of snow there and I see one inch of a tine sticking out. (laughs) It's the set. Oh, wow. I, I should have documented this. I did take some pictures. The one setting in the sun looks totally different, different color than the one I jerk out of the snow. Hmm. Set them side by side. It's the set. It's the buck I have on camera. It's the buck I let walk by me twice. Had him at 20 yards once for five minutes. And I'm thinking, if I would have found just one side of this instead of two, I would have really had to break down where that shed was laying to understand how long it's been there. But right. I got, I literally got both scenarios within 15 to 20 feet of each other. So let me ask you this. What would, so what would you have had to, uh, let me, let me speak English here. Sorry. <laughs> what would you had, would, 
<laughs> I don't know why I can't say this. What would you have had to discern with each different shed based on how you found it? So for example, like how would your evaluation differ between the one that was laying in the sun and the one that was laying and laying in the snow? Cause I'm just I, trying to, yeah, I'm trying to dictate how long they've been there. Right. 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 So that, I guess that's what I'm asking. Like, so one that's out in the sun obviously I, looks, feels different than the ones in the snow. So right. how would you, if you only had right. one of them, you know, per, great question. I can break, break that down for you. So let's say I only found one side. Pick sun or snow, and I'll explain both what I would have came up with the same answer. All right. Uh, let's, do, let's do sun. One was laying in the sun. So the sun, when I walk up on it, first thing I do when I see one that's exposed and that's been exposed for a while is I can tell how dry it is. I grab it. I look at the color. I can tell a little bit of the color is already taken out of it. Um, when my bucks die on their head, they are chocolate brown with some wet color to them. Okay. So as soon as I get them in the house for a couple of days, I got a wood stove in my basement. They whiten up a little bit. Mm-hmm. Even the dark brown ones, they get a little lighter. Yep. So the first thing I would have done when I, if I'd have found the one in the sun by itself, I'd have said, okay. And and I do this because I want to know if that buck was, is living there before. Bef- I want to know if I can kill that buck there. Correct. Correct. Based on the shed. Yes. That's what, that's, that's the, that's the, that's the, you know, that's the million dollar question. Yep. Is that shed worth putting stock into killing him here at this area next year? So by looking at that, I could tell that that shed that was out in the sunny side of the south corner, that just imagine a pointed ridge with a bluff on it that literally went from north to south 50 yards. Mm -hmm. And I'm right on the edge of where the timber is, too. So dark timber plays plays a big part of uh, deep snow. Anyway, so the one in the sun sitting there and I'm going, it's been there a month. (laughs) Easy. I could tell. Dried out in the month. Already losing some color. Okay easily been there a month okay so that tells me right there so let's go let's say let's just say fictitiously kind of close to a date i don't want to give away exactly what day i picked it up but let's say february 1st it's been there a month that puts it back to january 1st right right so that deer is killable then in late season yeah Yeah. exactly because i can hunt till christmas so what potentially that deer lives right there so then here's what i factor in next is that deer still here Mm mm-hmm did the snow ever move this deer? Well, at that spot, I didn't have over 18 inches of snow or 20 inches of snow all winter. Hmm. So I think that deer lives there. Okay. Got and, it. And guess what? I get that deer on camera a lot. Right. Not very far away on a community scrape. This crow flies half a mile. Right. All he did is moved out to where he's got a nice, warm, sunny hillside. Right. Right. Elevation wise, instantly I go into elevation. All right, this is this is a money elevation that I find sheds in for a reason. This is also a money elevation I find big buck beds in year round. Hmm. Guess what else is there? Habitat. I was gonna say food. (laughs) Yeah. So I I go every scientific aspect you can think of: slope, sun face, thermal cover, uh, security cover, feed, water sources. uh, Hard to get to without spooking easy for him to evade predators. I mean, I'm thinking 10 different things at once. Yep. Okay. Let's go to the shed in the snow. All right. I walk up on it. It's buried in snow. Well, guess what? When I pulled it out of the snow, my, my shed dog and I had to dig it out of the snow and we broke it out of the base of the snow that had ice. Mm. What's that tell me when that shed hit the ground? It hit the ground whenever it was still kind of the, the ground was probably bare or had just very little on it in Got and the big it. snows came right after the new year. Yep. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So then and you, we literally had to jerk it out of the ice at the, under a foot of, or let's say 10 inches of snow because the tines aren't a foot tall. Mm-hmm. So let's, they're about 10 inches, but 10 inches of snow, one inch of the tine was sticking out. I dig it. And instead of just grabbing it, not thinking and being excited, I'm like, okay, how deep is this sucker? Mm-hmm. It was in the ice bed at its base. And I had to, literally pry and pull on it to break it out of the ice right so that tells me right there that that buck shed between about january 1st and january 10th right boom that buck's huntable yeah so that's interesting man like that's the one thing where because of that snow man it really that weather really helps you backdate like from that perspective that's one thing i haven't taken advantage of in that 
that one big piece that I've been kind of scout last scouted last year and, you know, making a plan for going forward is that I've kind of been looking at the snowfall in that area as a negative. Cause it kind of sometimes impedes my uh, scouting only because I don't live super close to it. So I got to kind of time whenever I'm going to go up there and try to get as much done as I can while I'm there. But what I'm not realizing is like for shed hunting and stuff like that, I'm not really taking advantage of the snow that is there for what it can actually tell me. Right. And the next thing I do in that process is because that's a damn good deer. Guess what I spent the next two hours doing right there trying in that to, area. Trying to find other sheds? No. Oh. I went and got on every pounded trail that's been in the snow for over a month. And I walked them. And I wanted to see what every deer is doing in that thick cover mm-hmm. area that deer is hiding out in. And I basically found three different places to set up on him and kill him where he possibly could be. And I probably found eight to 10 different beds in those two hours. Yeah. You just backtrack. So you back trailed I, every great pounded trail down hmm. into the snow. That's just literally they were ice. Yeah. They've been walked on so heavily and it's so thick. The security cover in there, instead of just going shed hunting after that, because that's a potential target deer down yeah. the road. Yeah. I thought, man, I got to break this area down. And I probably spent, a, I spent about two hours in there. And that's what I love to do is I broke that whole area down, probably a quarter mile each way. See, and that's the difference between a guy who can shed hunt and scout at the same time. And a guy like me who will go out and shed hunt and and then, and or go scout later, you know, right. because and I did you end took... up finding three, I did end up finding three more sheds. Not even, you know, I, I still have a great eye for a shed. Right. But, but my priority shifted because of the quality of deer I just picked up and I knew him. Right. And I think that that's the part that a lot of guys that, that kind of divide and conquer, right. And shed hunt certain days and then, and then scout certain days is that they miss that opportunity that while the Intel is hot and in their mind that they don't take advantage. Cause like you asked me what you were going to do next. And I had the wrong answer because I was thinking shed hunting, you know what I mean? Whereas like no, the, the right answer was you just have a, a pile of intel that just fell into your lap take advantage exactly of it. yeah and that's what i love about it is you get to do both you can always go back and hammer the shed hunt now when the snow's gone right yeah you know and I, and i looked into that north i got into the north and i walked those northern trails in there on this steep mountainside and yeah. they're just incredible they're every animal coyotes cougar tracks elk tracks big whitetail sheds all using those same trails to get through the snow Right. Uh, and as soon as you get into the north, you get into a foot and a half. But guess where the trail is? A foot down into the foot and a half of snow, pounded down hard. Right. And it was just incredible. And then I'm like, this is the kind of stuff that you have to dive into from a big woods point of view. Or even even if you just own property or have a big chunk of private to hunt, it's so easy. You know, Andre was talking on a podcast the other day. And he said, do you realize that on my place in Iowa, I still find spots on it that I didn't know? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I can, I can believe it. I mean, like he's got, he, he said that and I thought, you know, that's pretty impressive to talk about when you really think about it. Cause you'd think that guy would know every inch right? and, and he does, but he still says when you got a thousand acres, you still find places that you walk right by or didn't take the time to really break down. Yeah. And those deer that live there year round night and day they know them better than we do yeah they pattern us all the time for sure yeah i i, I believe that a hundred percent um the one i i, 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 I want to be sensitive to your time because we've been on here for a little while but i had one last I'm good kind of good no i'm good anything you want to touch on i had an, had another question i wanted to ask you because you know i'm trying to i'm trying to figure out how to how to ask this, how to ask this question. Well, I, let me just transition to this. Cause I want to hear a little bit about the, about the, uh, about the pooch is helping you. Cause I've been having uh, this past kind of year, I guess, if you will, I've been kind of introducing my dog Rocky to, to shed hunting and he's done a pretty good job. We went out this past weekend and he's, he's transitioned from last year when I had him out, he had no clue what he was doing, you know, and he, when I would, you know, say, Hey, you know, find sheds, you know, he would, uh, he looked like he was lost. Yeah, I'll put it that way. This year I ask him to find sheds and I kind of really ask him whenever I'm in an area where I think there could be some sheds. And he really kind of, it all of a sudden he like a switch flips and he just kind of turns on, you know what I mean? Like he mm-hmm. knows he's, he's now looking and he starts kind of 
doing his tracking where he'll kind of like run these very specific loops through like these areas and, and look for sheds. And I can see that he's running up on stuff that kind of looks like a shed, but Oh, it's a stick, but he, he got the shape recognition. Like he thought it was something he went to investigate it and then it wasn't it. So then he turned around. You know, how long was it for you whenever you were working with, let's say your eight year old pup, your eight year old dog, how long was it, you know, until you really had what you felt was like, man, he's a really, really good shed dog. Like, was it, was it years? Was it, you know, first year he was like a, a whiz or, you know, how long did that kind of take till you, you were confident that he could, you know, pick up sheds regularly. Right. So his first shed season, we took him out and I think he was, I don't know, half a year old, six, seven years, six, seven months old, something like that. Mm-hmm. He ended up finding five on his own. But when we got him at seven weeks old, I just made it a rule in our house. That dog gets nothing ever, but a shed in his mouth, no <laughs> toys, no balls, no toys, nothing. And every time that dog has a antler in his mouth or brings it to you, you love him up. And that's what we did. Yep. And we love him up for it. And we played fetch when he was a baby mm-hmm. and he's a lab. He likes to fetch. Yep. So with Hank, my eight year old, the first season out, you, the biggest obstacles, and you see this with your dog is they get excited. They want to mm-hmm. go run around. We had to teach him that we're shed hunting and we had to keep talking to him all the time. Find a horn, Hank. And we say horn because when you say shed or shed, or if you say antler, it just, we found that if we say get a horn and, and I know everybody doesn't like the word horn for antler, but that's what we used as his cue because mm-hmm. it was easy to say. And at home, Hank, get a horn. And he just on it anyway. So we would use that term all the time in the woods. And I remember Ty and I, and Ty was little, you know, Ty was 10 and Ty would like stop him sometimes and say, Hank, slow down. This is when he was eight months old his first season out Hmm. slow down find an antler what made the difference was we found about a hundred antlers that year oh wow holy smokes well but here's what we did hank got to pick them all up everyone that we could get him to Hmm. so we would find one and i'd say hey ty i got one down here hank and call hank down when he was young and we would let we wouldn't tell him where it was at we'd say find a horn hank find a horn and as soon as that and sometimes you had to almost blind lead him right to it right as soon as he smelled it or saw it and i'd say hank picks him up by scent 75 percent of the time sight 25 (laughs) because his nose is so great and and he's always had an antler in his face in his nose in his mouth yeah and we let him chew on him like crazy at home to love because he loves that Mm -hmm. so we always let him chew on old ones and really learn the scent and all that stuff and then you get him in the woods you let him find every antler you find you never go pick it up first as soon as you do, you put human scent on it. Yep. So we did that. And at the end of Hank's first shed season at about seven or eight or nine months old, and I'd have to go back and do his birthday math, but it's somewhere around there. He found five or six by himself and ran them to us. That's awesome. And we loved him up like you wouldn't believe. Oh, yeah. No treats, no treats, nothing. Just love. Yep. And that came from a brother-in-law of mine that's trained bird dogs his whole life. Yeah. Another thing he taught me for your listeners, since we're on the topic and I'll try not to make this too long is when you take them in the woods when they're young, if you get a dog and want to train him yourself, and I'm doing this with Bo right now, Hank's son, is you walk away from them on purpose and you leave them because they love you and they don't want to lose you. So they'll stay with you and they'll find you. Mm -hmm. So I did that with Hank. I've done it with Bo and my dogs never leave me. They never run off. Yeah. Yeah. That's my, my dog. He's, I mean, like, I think I mentioned this to you when we talked the first time he, he was a rescue. So I had some unpacking to do with him. Um, he's, right. He's a, he's a black right. lab. Like he's, you know, he's pure, uh, black yep. lab. Um, but I had some unpacking to do and, and things like that. And so it was a little while until I got him steady enough to where, you know, I could trust him out in the woods, you know, with me to not, want to take off or whatever. Right. And, Cause he had other, he had other things he'd known to do. Yeah, exactly. And he wasn't treated the best either. You know, the previous owners didn't, I mean, it wasn't like they were right. super abusive to him or anything like that, but you know, he was, uh, he had anxiety because I'm sure they had some really small kids that like tormented him and stuff like that. And so okay. he, he just, you know, had some, he was, had some nervousness. And so I had to just kind of like, okay, I got you. Yeah. So you had to really, he had to learn to trust you on yeah. everything. Oh yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. And it took, yep. a, and it took a while. And the funny thing was, is it wasn't until I, um, you know, cause I've always, you know, I used to partially, you know, train dogs at one point in my life. I worked with a, worked with a trainer and worked with like a, an awesome breeder of, of, of Dobermans and, uh, 
of Rottweilers and stuff like that. So not labs, but like I, I kind of know enough about it to like get a dog to do what I want him to do. And I can usually get him to work off leash for me and stuff like that. And so he was a challenge because he had so many, and I always had my dogs from a pup, you know, he was the first one that I had that right. was a year old and I was taking over someone else's baggage to a degree that they had, that they had put on him. Um, and it was weird because I've always crate trained my dogs, you know, until they got to a trustable age, then they could be in the house like full time or whatever. But until I could trust them, I would always kind of crate train them as a pup, you know, that way if I needed to kind of crate them because someone didn't, you know, was coming over and was scared of dogs or whatever, it just, it was just, you know, convenient. He had a, must've had a really bad experience in crates because he would just lose his ever love of mind. And I finally got to a point where I was like, I don't know what to do with this guy. Like I can't like figure him out. And so I finally just let him in the house, like in the living room. I was like, all right, you can live upstairs. I'm going to trust you. And hopefully this calms you down. And it was like, it was like a flip, like a someone switched a flip or flipped a switch on him where right. just by him not having to be in a crate and being left to be in the house to sleep at night while we were sleeping and stuff like that he all of a sudden started trusting me more because I was letting him now be part of like the whole family all the time, you know, yep. and that was all he really wanted, you know, and I didn't know that, you know what I mean? Like I he can't talk to me. Right. So I'm trying to figure, I'm trying everything I know how to do to try to help him out. And it was just that one little thing. And as soon as yep. that happened, different dog, he started going on all the scouts with me. And then once I knew that he loved being out in the woods and just like, that's what he wanted to do. You know, he's a lab. So of course, that was when I was like, all right, let's up the ante and see if we can't help him find some sheds because I just love having him along and he loves being out here. And truth be told, I scout a lot more and cover a lot more ground when he's in the woods with me. Yep. I he, do too with my dogs. I do too. Yeah. Cause they're moving and they're, and they want, and, and honestly, for me, it's rewarding to get to watch them work. All oh night. man. It's the coolest thing to watch them oh. whenever, when he thinks, you know, like I, we were scouting this past weekend and, um, looking for some sheds and we, we didn't end up finding any, but he hits, he hit something like, I don't know if it was a bird or a rabbit or what it was, but man, he pointed, you know, he was just like, it was just like, it was watching <laughs> thousands of years of, of DNA and, and genetics just like go to yep. work. You know what I mean? Where it was yep. like, no one's ever taught him to do it. He just hit a trail, a scent trail and like one paw up point, like leaned out over tail, got real stiff. And was just like staring into the weeds, <laughs> you know? Yep. And it's just yep. the, cool, the coolest thing to watch them work. Well, I think to jump on that point is what really made Hank a great shed dog is one, he's he trusts and loves and knows how much he's loved and how much I loved. And, and here's the deal. You got, like you're saying, and, and I'm saying the same thing, you got to put the time in, yeah. like with anything. I have, I, it is so crucial to me this year to put extra hours in more than, I even think I have, and I'm going to do it because I can't fail Bo. If I don't put the time in with Bo, mm -hmm. Hank's son, Bo is not going to be ready to have that. Hank's second year was incredible. Mm -hmm. By Hank's third year, second year was incredible. He probably found 30 on his own. Wow. By his year three of being three years old as a shed dog, Ty and I had to bust our ass days and we're, we're pretty darn good at decent at it, efficient at it. We've been, I've been doing it forever. And my son and I grid and we cover the ground and we don't miss anything and good eyes. And anyway, Hank was finding as many as both of us some days <laughs> by, awesome. by year three. And then there's days two, just so the listeners, I don't, there's days two where we find more than Hank. Yeah. And there's days two where he's not quite on his a game as serious as we are. The one thing that I feel has been, and I'm not a professional dog trainer, but I knew, I just felt like I could train my dog to do this mm -hmm. if I just kept it simple and, again, loved him up for finding him. And he's incredible shed dog now. Yeah. Is we, here was the key. When it gets long in the day and he's not, hasn't found much, I just stay positive with him. I stay happy with him with my tone. Mm -hmm. And I just keep, I just keep praising him to keep working. Yep. And I tell him what a good dog he is and he gets happy and then he keeps trying. And what I found out with Hank in his year three, four and five years old, just a freaking would work himself into serious. Like he would almost work himself daily into a coma. He was so tired. Yeah. But he, but he loved it so much. He loved it so much. He would, I know if I'm doing 10 to 12 miles in the mountains or 15 in a day, which is a lot of mountain miles. Yeah. At a mile and a half per hour, 
Hank's doing 40 or 50. Oh, I know. I know. He's doing double to triple what I'm doing for sure. Double to triple. And you you see that with your, they do double to triple yep. the step we do all day long. Easy. Yeah. Probably triple or quadruple. Yeah. And you're right, man. You got to, I, I had a, I don't know if you know who Jeremy Moore is, but he's like a awesome dog trainer. That's what he does. Like gun dogs, you know, bird dogs, shed dogs, tracking dogs. That's like, you know, what he does for a living. And uh, yep. I had him on and we were talking about it. And he actually has, you know, some products that he uses and stuff like that. And I actually got bought his video just so I had like some, a framework to help, to help Rocky, you know? And, uh, right. and I kind of been going through that, man. And so the big kind of milestone for us this past weekend was I took him out, uh, while well, we were shed hunting, like the last place I went to kind of had this big fallow field. And one of the things I was working with Jeremy calls kind of, uh, memory trailing. So it's like, I basically took a shed, had a shed antler with me. And uh, got to this fallow field that was all kind of grown up and gnarly and did a couple, you know, uh, runs with him of, you know, a couple of different kind of training things that Jeremy, you know, suggests doing that he that he does with his dogs. And then the last one was basically me taking him out on a heel, walking him all the way through this fallow field that was about I don't know, like 75 yards long, getting toward the end of it, putting him on a sit and a stay, throwing the shed, you know, and making him have a delay and denying him to go get it bringing him all the way back 75 yards to the top of that field, making him sit there for a second and then tell him to go find the shed. And I wasn't sure he'd be able to go find it. And I'll be damned if that dog did not run directly through that field, through all that trash and go to within 15 feet of that shed and, and basically sniff it, sniff it out and find it. That's awesome. You know? And so it, I was like, I was like, I'll be damned, man. Like you're actually going to be able to do this. Like, you yeah, know what and, I mean? I yeah, was like, and that's the thing about a smart lab, even if they're a little older, if you work with him enough, he, and he gets loved up enough when he brings you one, oh, it's yeah. going to pretty, it's going to trigger in him that this is a pretty cool thing. Yeah. To do. Yeah. Yeah. He absolutely loves it. He gets, he gets loved up when he brings it back. And you know, anytime I pick up the shed, like he's all stoked. He knows it's, it's time to have some fun, whether it's in the backyard working with him or, you know, taking him out. He knows when I put certain clothes on, like he gets fired up. Cause he knows, Oh man, we're hitting the woods. Like he, like he, so, so funny. You bring that up. Hank every morning, my old dog, he does the same thing he, every, every, and he's taught Bo already. So here's the routine every morning here at this house. My wife and I get up, we have separate restrooms to get ready in. Um, and I have a couch I come out on and get ready. And my Hank just instantly checks all the clothes that I'm putting on. Yeah. <laughs> so he knows if we're shed hunting or if I'm going to work every yeah. day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If as, I, soon as, the, as soon as the shed clothes goes on, he goes nuts. Yeah, exactly. If I put a pair of base yep. layers on and walking around the house, or if I put on like a pair of brush pants, like upland pants yep. or something like that, he's like, yep. oh man, it's about to happen. <laughs> yeah. And the truth, and the truth, and the, like with my shed, I wear, I wear these funny my wife sewed them a hundred times i have my lucky shed bibs that i wear some old predator bibs predator camouflage nice and i've had them for so long and i found so many big sheds in them i literally tell my wife and my wife's awesome on a sewing machine i say honey i cannot get rid of these these are my shed hunting bibs and and she has sewn those this is no joke at least 30 times oh i'm sure <laughs> and we just it's patched and sewn and i won't get rid of them but Hank, since he's been a baby, has smelled that set of bibs. And mm -hmm. I don't wear them every time, but I wear them 75 to 90, you know, 80% of the time. And yeah, they, these dogs that are good shed hunters and these dogs that are just good hard workers and that are smart, um, that's what they live for is that day you take them out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And if My dog lives for it. He lives for it. Yeah. And I mean, if you want to have more fun than you thinks imaginable in the woods scouting and trying to find sheds, man, take a, take a good dog with you and just makes it that yeah. much, that much better. I take him, I have my travel trailer and then I, I take him on like travel trips to shed hunt and scout and stuff like that. Like yep. he just goes along with me well, and, and stays in it with me. So well, here's one thing with it. There's one thing I have to do getting back to hunting these big deer is when Hank brings me a big shed and if I can't see where he found it, I'll backtrack into where he found it because he can't pack two. Mm-hmm. And there's sometimes he's 50, 60, 80 yards from me. Hmm. So I'm always being very cognizant to where he come from. Uh, like he packed a 75 inch to me last Ooh. or last spring. Yeah. He packed a 75 inch. And even though it was old, man, I wanted to know everything about that deer. If I could find the other side, the genetic pool in there, you know, all of that. And he came from, you know, almost out of sight to where 
I'm always very, I'm really paying attention with, when he's with me because he's so good that I at least want to know, make sure he didn't loop around and find me to get to me or come, you know, I, I want to get back to where that shed was found because a lot of times with these bigger, older bucks, they'll trip them close to each other. A lot of the big deer, mm -hmm. my little, my little, my young deer seem to pack them all over. Right. And I don't know if it's a weight thing or whatever, you know, have much heavier rack. You want to get the bucks on old boys just, you know, they've done it for years. They want them off or whatever it is. But I tend to find my biggest, my biggest sheds a lot of times, not always, I mean, not even, probably not quite 50%, but a lot of times I find a set when right. they're, when they're an old deer, an old big whitetail, the set will be fairly close. Right. Well, cool, man. I, uh, we've been on here, man, for probably close to an hour and 40 minutes or something like that. I want to be sensitive to your time and let you, uh, let you get going. But before uh, I let you go, let folks know where they can follow along with you on social media or anything that you have going on. That you'd like them to like them to check out. Sounds good. Um, Instagram is mountain man. So it's MTN underscore man 33. And my YouTube's just Troy Pottinger and, and let's see. And then Facebook is Troy Pottinger, but yeah, I, Instagram's the way to get a hold of me. Um, it's unlimited and that's the, that's kind of my hunting more hunting oriented to where if somebody wants to get a hold of me, just send me a message on Instagram or, or follow my stuff on Instagram and, and I'll be glad to chat with you. And, you know, I'm, Right now, it's one of my favorite times of the year. I got it. You know, we're talking about all this. There's, there's nothing better for a true whitetail guy. If you don't like scouting and picking up sheds and learning new ground and wearing yourself out, yep. if you don't like to wear yourself out and feel that just exhilaration of being so damn tired at the end of the day that it feels great. And you bring a few antlers home and maybe you found that next buck you're going to kill. You know, that's pretty awesome. And it keeps me young. Uh, I love putting on the miles and, you know, I hope all your listeners that heard this today, if they have any more questions about just sheds and, and you know, there's a lot to actually breaking an area down to yeah. when you shed, if you're really looking for a big deer and, you know, or dog questions, or like I said, really take the time to decipher a shed you find instead of just picking it up and running, because you might be walking right by an incredible spot to break down and hunt the next year. You You might be. Right. You might not be, but you might be. Yeah. I will also add, if anyone has scrape questions, we go back and listen <laughs> to the episode you and I did together. Um, yeah. <laughs> this, this yep. past, uh, this past fall. Um, because I I'll tell you what, man, you know, I got some of the Pottinger, uh, special sauce and, uh, <laughs> the, I had a couple bucks that I was after that, man, they, uh, the one just came in. I mean, he was pissed. <laughs> like, <laughs> there was yeah, no other way it, to say it. Like he was fired up that someone had intruded his, his area. And I've been, you know, using, you know, using what you had shared with me and using your method. And I'm, I'm super stoked to get back to this big woods piece and, and, you know, further implement that because I really hadn't gotten, I didn't get back there, but once after you and I talked and I got, I still, I did some still hunting over a late season for like two days. Um, and I was able to kind of re kind of, freshen up a mock scrape i had previously made um but i'm planning to go up and do that because i know from talking to you it's when you're there just do it you know regardless of time of season um just you know start putting them out to to get them to you know to get them start start to get used so yeah scrape questions you're, you're, hit troy up because yeah. he is the uh he is the man with that well the, the great thing about scrapes and i know we got to get going is you put them out any time of the year any month white tails will hit that licking branch year round or they'll come back to that scrape, even if they move around, even if they get pushed, even if my, even my deer that migrate miles, they always come back to those great scrapes and show up and let everybody know they're back. Yeah, exactly. Cool, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on, brother. You have a good, uh, a good evening, have a good rest of the, uh, the winter. And, uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch throughout the, uh, the off season. I'll keep tabs on you and see what you're up to. Right on. Same to you and good luck out there breaking down some country. All right, folks, that is a wrap for today's show. I'd like to thank all of you for listening. And if you haven't yet, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating and be sure to subscribe to the podcast. And hell, while you're at it, head over to YouTube and give us a sub there too. I'd be super appreciative if you do those couple things for me. And before I shut this thing down, I need to give a big shout out to our partners who continue to help us make this podcast possible. Tethered, Spartan Forge, Exodus, and Skull Brew Coffee Company. And until next time, we'll see y'all.